Well, good morning to everybody. I am Dr. Laura Lacher and welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. We'll go ahead and get started with a few introductions um, and some logistics. So next week, please be sure to join us. We'll be hosting the annual CAMR Lectureship, and we will be hearing from Dr. Katherine Martin from Harvard on an approach to the patient with menopausal symptoms, hormonal and non-hormonal options. And again, that is a visiting lectureship, so we will be live on Tuesday at Providence St. Vincent in Southern Auditorium, and also live on Wednesday at Providence Portland Medical Center. So please be sure to come out and join us in person. And that uh, brings me to some logistics. So Grand Rounds is now a joint effort between Providence St. Vincent and Providence Portland. We are always here on this Teams Live platform. And when possible, we also meet in person. The invite every week will let you know if the talk is available only virtually or whether you can come join us in the auditorium. You can earn CME credit uh, for being live virtual, live in person, or watching a recording of the event. And a recording is always available at the same link as the invite to Grand Rounds. I'll be monitoring the Q&A throughout the session today, so please go, go ahead and post any comments or any questions for our speaker, and I will mostly hold those to ask at the end as time permits. And now for today's introductions. I'm so delighted to be joined by Dr. Sarah Boyles, a board-certified urogynecologist at the Oregon Clinic who's been a part of the Providence community since 2006. She completed medical school at the University of Pittsburgh and then her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at The Ohio State University, followed by fellowship in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery at OHSU. She has published extensively in her field and has been active in creating quality standards nationally through the American Urogynecologic Society. Dr. Boyles has been a top doc in Portland every year for the last seven years, recognizing the need for pelvic floor education in society at large and in our community. She has created the Women's Bladder Doctor, an online platform with quality content for women seeking information on pelvic floor and bladder issues. Dr. Boyles brings such depth of experience and passion to this super important topic. Thank you so much for coming to teach us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here for this virtual Grand Rounds. Over the years, I've had the privilege of taking care of many of your patients. I'm here today to update you on treatments for female urinary incontinence, and I hope to give you some additional tools for treating these patients, <clears throat> if those tools fit into your practice. I know that your plates are all very full these days, and as always, my group is happy to see these patients at any point in their workup. My talk is evidence-based, but I do have a few disclosures. I was on the board for Renovia, which made the Lenovo Pelvic Health Solution. This company has now dissolved, and I have no affiliation with the current company, that's Exena. I'm also on the medical board for the East Pavilion Surgery Center, and I'm the site PI for two ongoing clinical trials, Nuspera, which is a sacral nerve stimulator, and Ecoin, which is a tibial nerve stimulator, both treatments for overactive bladder. And I'm the CEO of the Women's Bladder Doctor, which is a company focused on educating women on bladder issues, but all of the information from the site that I'll reference is free. So today, I hope to tell you about the spectrum of treatments for both stress and urgency urinary incontinence, excuse me, and to help you understand both the local and virtual resources to facilitate treatment of female urinary incontinence, and also what you can do to help these patients. So why do we care about urinary incontinence? So I'm passionate about leaking because I see the negative impact that it has on women's lives daily and because I'm a fixer by nature and it gives me great joy to improve quality of life. But why should you care? Well, there are a couple of different reasons. And the first is that it is a prevalent condition. So this data comes from a study in Norway where they queried 28,000 women, which was 80% of the population in the region. And you can see the prevalence here on the y-axis and then age of the patient population or of the population on the x-axis. 
And then incontinence severity progresses from the light color to the dark color where the black is severe. And what they found is they found that the, the prevalence of any incontinence is 25%, and the prevalence of moderate to severe incontinence is 16%. And this data likely underestimates the prevalence in the United States because we're a much more obese nation than Norway, and obesity increases the risk of incontinence. There's also a lot of data out there talking about how in how incontinence impacts quality of life. So even a small amount of leakage negatively impacts quality of life for women. Women that have urinary incontinence have a negative body image and low self-esteem. Urinary incontinence is uh, associated with increased sexual dysfunction and it impacts social, physical, and sexual well-being. So one of the things that I say to my patients all the time is that it's hard to feel vibrant and active and like a vital member of society when you're leaking urine. Incontinence also increases the risk of various health factors. So in older women, uh, incontinence increases the risk of falls. When it, uh, women fall, they're more likely to have fractures. So we see an increased risk in fractures as well. It increases the risk of depression quite significantly. And it's also associated with an increased risk of hospitalization. And then incontinence is also expensive. So in 2022, it was estimated that $25 billion a year is spent on urinary incontinence. 30% of this is paid by payers, but there is a significant out-of-pocket expense for women as well. And women with urinary incontinence are also more likely to seek health care. So these are the reasons why we care about urinary incontinence, because it's common, it has an incredible negative impact on quality of life, it increases medical risks, and it is expensive. So there are different types of urinary incontinence in women, stress incontinence, urgency urinary incontinence, mixed incontinence, which is stress and urgency together, and then other. The other category includes things like overflow when you're not emptying well, functional if you have trouble moving and can't get to the bathroom, and extra urethral, which includes symptoms or conditions like fistulas. But in women, 95% of the incontinence that we see is stress, urgency, or mixed. So as you know, stress incontinence happens when women uh, leak with exercising, cough, sneeze, and laugh. And what happens in this condition is that the urethral pressure isn't enough to hold the urine inside. So you do an activity, you generate an abdominal pressure with a valsalva, and that pressure is higher than the urethral pressure and you leak urine. It is a very mechanical problem. Urgency urinary incontinence is a little bit different, and in this condition, the bladder contracts when it should not. So your bladder should only contract when you are sitting on the toilet and telling your, your brain is telling your bladder that it is a good time to empty. And with urgency urinary incontinence, your bladder starts contracting when you're not ready for it to and when it should not be contracting. And this results in leaking before you can get to the restroom. We talk a lot about overactive bladder, and this is a condition that was coined by the pharmaceutical industry, and it includes urgency urinary incontinence and mixed urinary incontinence, but then it also includes symptoms of urgency, frequency, nocturia, um, so bothersome symptoms, but not actually associated with leaking. The treatments for overactive bladder are the same as urgency urinary incontinence. It's just considered to be a less severe condition, although it can be very bothersome. So this is a little bit of a busy slide. It comes from Incontinence, the seventh edition, which just came out this year. And it talks about the initial management of urinary incontinence in women. And so the first thing that I would draw your attention to 
um, is this red box over here. And these are patients that should be sent on to specialized management. And it includes patients who have recurrent incontinence, so their incontinence was treated and it came back. Um, and then incontinence that's associated with pain, hematuria, recurrent infection, significant voiding symptoms. So we always want to see the patients who aren't emptying well or who feel like they aren't emptying well. Patients that have had pelvic radiation, even if this radiation was for um, a cancer not associated with the urinary tract. So I see a lot of patients that had radiation for anal cancer. Um, patients that have had radical pelvic surgery or maybe just a lot of pelvic surgery and then suspected fistulas. For most patients, the initial workup is fairly straightforward. So you're talking to them about if they leak, um, trying to figure out why they leak and do they want treatment. So not all women with incontinence will want treatment. You're screening them for other symptoms, neurologic symptoms, when it started, if it's associated with the medication or anything that they're doing. And then physical exam, including a pelvic. So it's important to make sure that there isn't a prolapse or a mass that's happening. You want to assess estrogen status. Many women who are perimenopausal or menopausal will have an increase in urgency and frequency and overactive bladder symptoms, maybe recurrent UTIs or feeling like they have a UTI, but um, cultures are negative. And that is usually genitourinary syndrome of menopause, which vaginal estrogen can do wonders. You want to assess their pelvic floor muscles, make sure that they're contracting correctly, that they're not doing a valsalva, making sure that that muscle can actually contract and that it kind of pulls the finger in and up. And then you want to do a urinalysis, do a urinalysis plus minus culture, and you're really looking for blood or infection here. This is the 3IQ questionnaire, which was a questionnaire that was developed for use in um, the primary care office. It's three simple questions, and it helps differentiate between types of incontinence. And this third question here, during the last three months, did you leak urine most often, helps you differentiate between stress only or stress predominant, urge only or urge predominant, mixed, or a different cause. I would tell you that the ability to assess incontinence with history alone or with a questionnaire decreases with age. And there are definitely patients where you can't figure out why they're leaking, or at least I can't always figure out why they're leaking based on talking to them. I don't do testing or urodynamics on all of my patients, but sometimes if I really cannot figure out why they're leaking, I will go on to additional testing. Okay, so let's get started with treatments for stress urinary incontinence. So the first line of treatment for stress urinary incontinence is pelvic floor muscle training. And when we have women do pelvic floor muscle training, if they do it correctly and complete the full course, around 67% of women will be markedly improved or cured. We consider physical therapy to be the gold standard, and the reason for this is because it keeps patients accountable, it keeps patients doing the exercises, it takes a good 6 to 12 weeks of exercises before they notice a benefit, and it's hard to keep exercising when you're not seeing a benefit. They also assess the surrounding musculature, is there hip flexor tightness or issues with your glutes, um, and then they help coach you and, and motivate you. And so physical therapy is really the gold standard. Um, you may know this, you may not know this. So Providence PT does an amazing job and they actually have a virtual group class. And this group class is available right now only for PHP patients. But for many women, it's a great introduction to pelvic floor physical therapy um, and can help them get started on their own as well. So as much as I would like every woman to see a pelvic floor physical therapist, there actually aren't enough pelvic floor physical therapists in the U.S. to go around. So we don't have enough. 
Um, and there was a group out of Canada that looked at this, Dumoulin's group in Montreal, and they compared, they did a randomized controlled trial looking at one-on-one -on -one PT versus PT done in a group class. And what they found is that the group class, and they're not checking um, individual muscle strength in the group class, they found that group classes work as well if the patient has been taught to Kegel correctly. <clears throat> And they actually found that satisfaction for the women increased in the group class, likely because there's a little bit of a breakdown of stigma when you're doing this with other like people. So this randomized controlled trial um, extended into COVID, and so they actually stopped meeting um, in person and they switched to online. And they studied that as well, and they found that online classes work as well, and they had to figure some things out to make it work online. But they found that it works as well, again, if the patient has been taught to Kegel correctly, and that uh, patient satisfaction was high with this as well. So if you have a patient who is motivated and wants to do pelvic floor muscle training and they want to do it at home, <coughs> excuse me, they want to do it at home, they're not interested in one-on-one -on -one PT, there are a lot of virtual options that are out there. And so um, I'm just showing you three options that are out there, the vagina coach, mama made strong, and the vagina rehab doctor. <clears throat> the vagina coach is a physical trainer. The other two women are physical therapists, and these women have created online programs that are available at a cost, but have been shown to be beneficial for women if someone is interested in doing something on their own. <clears throat> um, they um, have programs to keep patients accountable and keep them doing the exercises, and there's more of a personal touch, and so this definitely appeals to some people. And then there's also concierge PT, so physical therapists that'll come to your house. And the difference between this and home PT is that these, it's not for patients that would qualify for home PT. So for women that have a new baby or uh, maybe someone who has a new baby and two kids at home and getting out of the house just doesn't quite work, this too is a great option. So what about patients who want to do Kegels on their own and aren't interested in um, doing anything with someone? And I would tell you that there is a lot of data out there showing that Kegels do work, but like all strengthening exercises, the exercises have to get progressively harder over time. So usually we tell patients to start in a supine position and then do them seated and then do them standing. So as you stand, the exercises become harder. They have to do three sets of 10. We have them contract and hold the contraction and you wanna increase the length of the contraction. So up to 10 seconds. And they have to keep doing these exercises for um, six to 12 weeks to see a benefit. But Kegels absolutely do work if you're doing them correctly, if they get harder over time um, and you keep doing them. So a lot of women come in and ask me about peri trainers. And again, if you Kegel correctly, a peri trainer will help. So peri trainers are over-the-counter devices um, where there's a vaginal insert. They theoretically tell you how well you are contracting. They give you a program. They will document your progress. The problem with peri trainers is they um, measure pressure in the vagina and the device cannot differentiate between a good Kegel contraction and Valsalva. Both of those increase the pressure in the vagina. So if you're someone who Valsalvas instead of contracting, you're going to think that you're getting better. You're going to think that the exercises aren't working for you, but you're actually just doing it all wrong. And so that um, is the issue with peri trainers. So the Leva is a smart pelvic floor trainer, and the difference between the Leva and um, your traditional peri tra trainer is that it actually measures muscle movement. And so it can tell you if you're doing the exercise correctly. Um, this device is only available with a prescription. 
Um, it is starting to be covered by insurances. It's covered by Cigna at this point in time. It also offers a coaching component. So there's a live person that will talk to the woman, answer any questions, um, offer support, and that can be once a week, more if someone wants it, less if they're really not interested in it. And then this device also gives feedback to the physician in terms of progression. Um, so this slide is about the Leva, but truthfully, most peri trainers um, have similar setups. So on the right here, this is the Leva. This is the part that goes in the vagina. This um, slide here, or the part of the slide, the image that's on the left, um, shows you how much the muscle is moving as you contract the muscle, and so you can see your progression over time. Um, and then this is shows you your training progress. So you can see how you're doing. You can document your symptoms. Um, and and most peri trainers have um, an app that is comparable to this. So what about products that contract the pelvic floor for you um, where you're not actually doing the contraction on your own? And the ones that you hear the most about are the Imcella, which is a chair, and the Novo, which is a pair of shorts. And these actually will strengthen the pelvic floor, but it's not clear how long the effect will last. They're often expensive and that um, cost is out of pocket. So one of the reasons that pelvic floor physical therapy um, lasts longer than we normally think it is, is because women learn how to do the exercises and then they incorporate it while they're doing their day-to-day -day activities. And we don't think that happens with these products. Um, and, and so it's not, um, it doesn't have as long of an effect. So this picture on the left is the Imcella chair, and the Imcella chair is a high intensity focused electromagnetic wave to create a super maximal contraction. And you sit on it for half an hour, uh, once a week for six weeks. Uh, it's not painful, but it is unlike anything that you've ever felt before, where you definitely feel your whole pelvic floor contracting. Um, and this is the Innovo shorts. So the Innovo shorts use an electrical stimulation to contract the pelvic floor. And you are to do it um, five times a week for 30 minutes for 12 weeks to see the maximum benefit. Um, <clears throat> these shorts, they have to fit you correctly. They come in different sizes. I tried them. Um, in order for them to work, you have to, your glutes contract before the pelvic floor contracts. And based on the way they fit me, I personally found that to be painful, but not everybody does. So if pelvic floor strengthening is not enough to treat a patient, then the next thing that I offer is an incontinence pessary. So this is a picture of our typical incontinence pessary. We have to fit these in the office. And I would tell you that about 40% of women are cured with an incontinence pessary, and it goes up to about 53% if we add behavioral therapy. So that knob is supposed to sit underneath the urethra, um, and it supports the urethra. So when you cough, sneeze, laugh, jump, the urethra gets pressed against the knob um, and that closes the urethra so you don't leak. <clears throat> That's the way all of our treatments for stress incontinence work. That's the way a sling works as well. The problem is the knob shifts, right? So if your bladder's full, you're exercising, you have to poop, it moves and then it doesn't work quite as well. There are over-the-counter incontinence pessaries. So the Impressa is the one that most people have heard about, and that's here on the left. The Impressa you can wear for about eight hours, and then you have to throw it away. I do have my patients lubricate it before they place it because I find that this material is uh, frequently uncomfortable. The Revive is a newer um, over-the-counter um, pessary. I haven't had anyone try it yet. Um, but it is out there. And then um, this last one is the Uresta. So the Uresta isn't over the counter. It actually requires a prescription. 
It was initially developed by a urogynecologist who is Canadian, and it's over the counter in Canada. Um, here you have to have a prescription, but there's no fitting appointment. And so what that means is you write the prescription and the patient gets three different sizes to try. There are five sizes total and they get the three middle sizes. If those sizes don't work for them, then they can call the company and they'll be sent the smallest or the largest um, for no additional cost. The pessary, if you look at it, it's symmetric, and so it doesn't have that same rotational effect that our traditional pessaries do. And so I actually find this to be um, more efficacious for women. The one thing I would tell you about the Uresta is it is made out of hard plastic, and I've never had a patient look at it and say, oh gosh, you know, that looks like it would be comfortable. I mean, you definitely have to warn people it's going to look uncomfortable. It's not going to feel uncomfortable, um, but it is worth trying. And the data currently on the Uresta is that more like 75% of women benefit from it. There are urethra seals, and so this is really a patch that you put on the urethra to um, minimize leaking. You clearly have to remove it to avoid, and it only works for a small amount of leakage. But I think that this is, you know, a nice additional treatment for the right person at the right time. So different things that we can do in the office. So we do a lot of urethral bulking, and I would tell you that urethral bulking is really great for women who don't have time for surgery, other things haven't worked, or for women who aren't done having children, because we really don't want to do a surgery if you want more children. Um, Urethral bulking improves leaking in about 50 to 70 percent of women. There are multiple materials that are available on the market. So when I first started practice, we use collagen. We don't use collagen anymore. We use three different materials, coaptite, macroplastic, and bulkamid. And they're all about um, the same efficacy, but bulkamid does last longer. You may require multiple injections. It'll wear off over time. And traditionally it's been about two years, but Bulkamid looks like it lasts for up to seven years. It should be considered to improve leakage, but not cure, but the benefit is no downtime. So I recently did a Bulkamid on a provider who was leaking in the office as she was seeing patients. She was also a big runner and it removed all of the day-to-day -day leakage that she had, but on trail running, she would continue to leak. And so I, I think of this as something that works, but not for high impact activity. So that brings us to surgery. And I'm not gonna say a lot about surgery. I would tell you that we still consider mesh slings to be the gold standard with an 85% cure. The meshes um, are a very standardized procedure and they work the same way in everyone. And so it's a very consistent um, result that we see. And so I am not afraid of mesh at all. And I, I do think that it is the gold standard, but a lot of patients are afraid of mesh. And you know I would tell you that surgeries can absolutely be done without mesh. And there are lots of different surgical approaches that we can talk about with patients. Um, An incontinent surgery does not have to include mesh. So there's some ongoing research with stem cell therapy right now. So there's an ongoing phase three clinical trial where they're doing a muscle biopsy um, from the quadricep muscle and taking autologous mesenchymal stem cells and then injecting them back into the urethra after they have been um, appropriately processed. And I would tell you that the data, the initial data from these trials look really good. There have been some additional um, trials in adipose tissues, but it looks like muscle biopsy is kind of um, proving to be a little bit more effective. And so this is a really um, exciting new development for stress incontinence. I think this is what a lot of women really want um, to use their own tissue and to move away from mesh. So I'm I'm super excited about this. And then <clears throat> laser treatments and radio frequency. So there's a lot of marketing on these different procedures. Um, 
lots of talk about vaginal rejuvenation and you know improving everything that you could think about with a laser. But the most recent data shows that um, a CO2 vaginal laser is equivalent to sham, and that is the same as radio frequency. So neither one has been proven to be um, better than sham, and and that has you know was clearly um, done with randomized controlled trials. There is some thought um, that the YAG laser may help with mild leaking. Um, so definitely not with significant leaking, but we may get to a point where we say, if you have mild leaking, we start with a laser. And then if it is, um, you know, kind of in a moderate to severe um, category based on strict criteria, then we move on to surgery. But but we're definitely not there yet. And I would say that there is no data to support doing this for stress incontinence at all. Okay. So I'm going to transition now to urgency urinary incontinence and the treatments. So just like with stress incontinence, the first line of treatment is pelvic floor muscle training. And again, this is best done with a pelvic floor physical therapist um, if that person is available. So with urgency urinary incontinence, we start with strengthening and we start with some behavioral modifications. We're looking to strengthen the muscles. We're looking to teach women urge suppression and then to implement dietary and behavioral modifications. So when we talk about dietary and behavioral modifications, the first thing is really fluid management. And so what I will usually do is I'll have a patient do avoiding diary where they're documenting how much they're drinking and what they're drinking in 24 hours and then how much they're emptying. If that 24 hours represents um, kind of what's happening with them. I just have them do it for 24 hours. And, and one of the things that I find is many of my patients, just in documenting it, realize what they're doing wrong, right? That, you know, that 64 ounces of Diet Coke is really what's causing their problems. And then they quickly modify their behavior and that's all we need to do. Sometimes I do have to talk to patients about minimizing fluids or not drinking so much at night if they're getting up a lot. We talk to patients a lot about um, bladder irritants, and there's a whole list of bladder irritants. Um, caffeine and alcohol are the big ones that I think everybody thinks about. One that I see pretty commonly in the office these days is carbonated water, which is a bladder irritant. And then if you add flavorings, especially the citrus flavorings, that can cause a problem. And that's just something that I think many women think of as a healthy alternative, um, and they don't realize that that could be causing some of their problems. I usually have patients remove one thing at a time, um, and I always tell people that, you know, it's important for you to know how things impact your body, but it doesn't mean that you have to cut everything out every day, right? If you like your coffee and you're staying home and it causes you frequency, then you can absolutely do that, but maybe you don't do that when you're traveling. Um, I'll talk a little bit about more um, about timed voiding on the next slide. And then weight loss has been shown to help with all types of leaking. Um, and managing constipation absolutely helps with overactive bladder symptoms. Sometimes frequency is really behavioral and, and just based on some bad habits. And so we'll have patients do timed voiding um, where we have um, the person void based on a determined interval. So they're not paying attention to their own bladder cues and they go to the bathroom, let's say every 90 minutes. And we have them do that um, for three days while awake. And then we lengthen the interval time every three days by about 15 minutes until they get to an acceptable frequency. And this um, can dramatically help frequency and the associated urge. And then urge suppression. So urge suppression is using your own body's reflexes. So your urethral sphincter and your bladder muscle always work as a team, right? So if your bladder, your detrusor is contracting, then the urethral sphincter is relaxing so urine can get out. If the urethral sphincter is closed, right, then the detrusor should relax. 
So if you do a Kegel contraction, you're contracting your pelvic floor and you're contracting the urethral sphincter. And what that does is it signals the bladder and tells the bladder to stop contracting. So with urge suppression, we have patients do five quick pelvic contractions, right? And so you're contracting your sphincter, your sphincter is telling your bladder to stop contracting, and then the patient needs to distract themselves, right? So <clears throat> they need to take a deep breath, they need to relax, they need to try to activate their parasympathetic system, they need to meditate, um, visual imagery, whatever works for them, that contraction will pass and then they can walk to the bathroom. The stronger their muscles are, the better this works. <clears throat> this is a super easy thing to talk about. It's a it's a hard thing to learn to do. And so it, it takes um, some support for women to master this. So if those things don't work, then the next line of therapy, so that second line of therapy for overactive bladder is medications and supplements. So there are eight medications available right now for overactive bladder. Um, six of them are anticholinergics, and then there are two that are in the beta-3 agonist group. And there are some long acting ones. There are some short acting ones. There are some that are um, available in topical uh, formulations. But most of the anticholinergic data um, comes from short term industry sponsored trials and they compare each medication to placebo. The magnitude of improvement documented in the FDA registry trials range from 50 to 80% reduction in incontinence episodes and 10 to 30% reduction in urinary frequency with high rates of placebo effect. No one medication has really been proven to be better than the other, but I would tell you that for some patients, one will have a better side effect profile and that changes based on the patient. Um, in general, 50% of patients report adequate control of their symptoms with anticholinergics, but discontinuation rates are high. And after a year, less than 50% of patients are still on these medications. The beta-3 agonists have similar control, symptom control rates of about 50%, but lower discontinuation rates. So <clears throat> the beta-3 agonists are merbegron and verbegron, and I would tell you that with merbegron, you do need to check blood pressure because it can elevate the blood pressure in a minority of patients. So anticholinergics and dementia risk is something that's been getting a lot of publicity lately. It's something that I think we as physicians worry about. It's something that our patients worry about. And there is increasing epidemiologic evidence for the association between anticholinergics and cognitive impairment. So if someone uses these medications for a year, um, the odds ratio is 1.5 of developing cognitive impairment. So this increased risk is small. Number to harm is 37, but it's really not an acceptable risk for many patients. The higher the dose um, that you're on, the longer that you're on that medication and the older you, you are, the more likely you are to be affected. Um, and there is this um, population-based retrospective match controlled study that looked at the risk of dementia and anticholinergics versus beta-3 agonists. And it did find that the risk with anticholinergics is higher. So right now, the recommendations or the expert recommendations, um, and these aren't guidelines yet, are that when pharmacologic therapy is indicated for OAB, that you start with a trial of beta-3 agonists. Insurance companies definitely are not on board with this, but it, the thought is that this is the, less, the least risky medication. When OAB anticholinergics are indicated, and there are definitely times where the benefit outweighs the risk for an individual patient, oxybutynin immediate release is really the one that should be avoided because that's the one that um, has the highest association with dementia. Um, and there are alternatives with more favorable pharmacologic profiles like the extended release trospium, which doesn't cross the blood brain barrier, darfenicin, and phezoteridine. 
There are some supplements that have been shown to help overactive bladder. Um, I actually do give my patients pumpkin seed oil and you can get that over the counter in Azo bladder control. So Azo has a couple of different formulations now and the one that is called bladder control um, actually has pumpkin seed oil in it. There aren't a lot of side effects and it does help overactive bladder with some patients. Gosha Jinkigan has been shown to help, but there are side effects of nausea and diarrhea. Um, magnesium hydroxide has also been shown to help, but there are significant side effects with that as well. So those aren't ones that I usually prescribe. Um, if medications and supplements don't work, then we move on to third line therapy for overactive bladder, which includes Botox treatment and nerve stimulations. So Botox is something that uh, we use a lot in the office. We inject it um, in the office. Um, and that's something that is usually pretty well tolerated by patients. Um, we just instill a little bit of lidocaine in the bladder and then do the injection, which is five, five to 10 injections. It's 65% effective treatment. It lasts for six to nine months on average. I would like it much better if it lasted for a year or longer, but that is unlikely to happen. There is an increased risk of retention and about 2% of patients will need to catheterize while the Botox is working. For some patients, that's reasonable because they're in control and their bladder is better. For some patients, it's totally not acceptable. And so that's a really important thing to talk about with patients ahead of time. There is an increased risk of UTI as well, and it's important to know if patients are getting Botox injections anywhere else since it is so commonly used for different therapeutic indications. Um, I like Botox a lot because it's a local treatment, so it just works in the bladder. Um, if it's someone who is more medically fragile, they're not getting um, any systemic effects from it. Um, but talking to them about that risk of retention is important. And so I usually tell patients that, you know, for any one patient, it's either 100% or 0%. And I really, I don't know which one you're going to be. So there are different nerve stimulations for overactive bladder. So there are sacral nerve stimulations and then there are tibial nerve stimulations. So when we do a sacral nerve stimulation, we're putting a lead in um, at S3. And yes, that does mean that I'm doing a back procedure, which was you know, an interesting transition way back when. There's always a trial period when we do this. So you implant a temporary lead to see if the patient is better. So they do bladder diaries before and during um, that trial, and they have to be at least 50% better to implant the permanent lead in the battery. There are different ways that you can program the lead. So if it becomes less effective over time, you can um, change it with just a Bluetooth application, uh, which makes it really easy for patients. 60 to 90% of patients report improvement, 30 to 50% report cure, and then in about 3% of patients, we have to remove or revise the device. The devices right now are MRI compatible. That's a new development over the last couple of years. There are different types of batteries that you can implant. There's one that's rechargeable, one that is not rechargeable, um, but they last for over 15 years at this point in time. So it uh, is, you know, kind of a long acting solution for many women. You can also stimulate the tibial nerve. So the tibial nerve runs along the medial part of the ankle. So tibial nerve stimulation. So there are three different ways that you can stimulate the tibial nerve. So you can do it at home with the TENS unit. Patients can come into the office and we do it once a week. It's a 30 minute session. They have to do it for um, 12 weeks and that's the full treatment. They usually don't notice a benefit till about six weeks. Um, and then after that, there's a maintenance phase, right? So patients have to come in at a regular interval to maintain the effectiveness. Um, and that interval is different for everybody. So for some patients, it's once a month. For other patients, it's once every six months. So we have to figure that out. Um, usually if it's once every month or so, that's just too soon. Um, and then, you know, most patients don't consider it to be an effective treatment. There's also this new 
um, implant called eCoin. Um, there are a couple others that are coming to market but aren't there yet. eCoin has been available for about 18 months in the United States. Um, and it's actually an implant. So you do a little surgery, implant this device that's about the size of a nickel into the ankle to stimulate that nerve and help with overactive bladder. That battery or that stimulator only lasts for three to five years right now, um, which is probably the biggest negative about eCoin. It just doesn't last long enough yet. So for a TENS unit, we see 25 to 45% cure rates for urgency urinary incontinence, but for someone who's at home, has trouble getting out, sometimes that's a great option. PTNS, 60% improvement of urgency urinary incontinence, um, and ECOIN, 82% improvement and 36% cure. So what can you do to help these women with incontinence? And I would tell you that my one ask is that you validate their symptoms. So if you do the whole workup or don't do the whole workup, I think validating the symptoms is really the most important thing. So this sounds super easy, but often it's not. Um, the conversation around incontinence is increasing, but it's still a fairly taboo subject for a lot of women. Women with incontinence often have symptoms for over seven years before they seek help from a medical professional. Since lots of women don't discuss these symptoms, they also feel like they're alone. It's very isolating. They may not be comfortable talking about these organ systems. Um, and there's also a lot of associated shame and embarrassment. And this means that incontinence is often the last thing that someone will say to you is your hand is on the doorknob and you are about to exit the room and move on to the next patient. And it's not an, always an easy conversation to have or a quick conversation. So to help you deal with kind of this last minute delivery of a complex problem, I created this free bladder star starter series and I designed it for women who are up to date with their preventative care, but have incontinence and aren't sure where to start. And it's available on my website, thewomensbladderdoctor.com. So it's a series of six short videos that discuss the passive pathophysiology of incontinence and the first steps that women can take at home to improve it. So ideally, this would make addressing incontinence easier for you. For patients, some women would be able to help themselves or cure their leaking with pelvic floor strengthening and behavioral changes. And for any specialist, patients present better understanding of incontinence and have already started working on it, which always makes the job easier because we can start further along. If you're planning on completing the initial workup, <clears throat> here are you know, the things to really screen for and when to send the patient on. So any neurologic symptoms, radical pelvic surgery or a lot of pelvic surgery, pelvic radiation, pain, recurrent incontinence, recurrent UTI, and fistula. And then in terms of physical exam, you just want to make sure that they've had a pelvic exam. Remember that just because someone calls their discharge urine doesn't mean that it is. It could be that there's a vaginal infection. I diagnose one to two um, <clears throat> pelvic cancers a year um, that present with some form of discharge. You want to look for prolapse. Um, you want to make sure that there aren't masses, aren't infections, and you really want to screen for genitourinary syndrome of menopause because even if that isn't the full answer, it is often a contributing factor. And then um, also checking for strength, which I didn't include in that, and then your analysis looking at hematuria and infection. For stress incontinence, um, we do have a great um, pelvic floor physical therapy department at Providence. Their online class is super helpful for a lot of patients. You could consider prescribing the Leva, right, which is that smart device, and we'll teach patients to do a contraction correctly since it doesn't just follow um, pressure. There are a lot of online courses that women really benefit from as long as they're kegeling correctly. Um, the uresta, so that is that um, pessary, that incontinence pessary that doesn't require a fitting appointment is an easy thing and can help a lot of women. And then over-the-counter pessaries are a totally reasonable thing for women to try. 
Um, urgency urinary incontinence, again, shout out to Providence PT because they really do a great job in their online class. Um, you can talk to patients about behavioral changes. Um, if they go to PT, PT also does this. Pumpkin seed oil is a reasonable thing to try. And then if you're prescribing medications, remember that you really want to try to avoid um, the immediate release oxybutynin since that is the one that is most associated um, with memory losses and especially in older patients. If you're interested in referring these patients to our group, we're always happy to see them. Um, I would tell you that we work with an increasing number of nurse practitioners and physicians assistants, and so they may not see a physician, but I manage all of our treatment protocols on the west side. Um, we also offer virtual appointments, which kind of started at the beginning of the pandemic, and many women prefer a virtual appointment when discussing these issues. So I do a lot of virtual appointments um, as news or new appointments as virtuals, and um, I'm always amazed at how much more comfortable women seem to be discussing these issues in their own home environment. So I do know that wait times can be long. It's a chaotic time in healthcare and we're working on this issue. But in the meantime, after talking about wait times with some of you, I also created a podcast that's called While You Wait. It's available anywhere that you get podcasts. Um, and the goal here is to help women get started before they're seen in the office. So this is an example of one of the episodes. So this is episode one, uh, season one, episode seven, where I talk about what to expect at the first office appointment. I, I really love this episode because I talk about things like why it's so important to fill out the paperwork, um, how to get the most out of the vis visit, asking me your most important questions at the start of the visit, or even sending them before you come into the office. Um, there are episodes on all different incontinence products and treatments, and I address a lot of the common questions that I get asked. Um, and I just wanted to also point out this episode here, which is episode 25. So I did an interview with MJ Strohall, who is the lead of the Providence Pelvic Floor Physical Therapy team. And we talk about what PT is like, what patients can expect, um, down to the nitty gritty of what that room is like, right? So patients ask me all the time if there's going to be, you know, some cute guy next door getting his knee worked on. Um, and so this is really to help patients before um, they go to that pelvic floor appointment to feel more comfortable. Um, all of the resources that I talked about are available on my website, thewomensbladderdoctor.com. And my goal here is really to help more patients than I can help in the office because so many women are struggling with these issues and it's hard to find um, good information. So my final thoughts for you are that urinary incontinence is common. Um, there are more and more treatments being developed all the time. So it's an exciting time in, in this part of the field. Um, and we are always happy to see these patients. Okay, questions? Wow, Dr. Boyles, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, a lot of kudos here in the chat. Um, so comprehensive in the care of our patients. Um, and thanks for your grace, uh, everyone, with our technical issues. I know we're right at nine, so I'm gonna pose you just one question um, before we close today from our audience. Um, so they are wondering how you objectively evaluate whether treatment is helpful. And maybe particularly thinking about those patients that we often have in primary care who perhaps have been on a medication for overactive bladder for years. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times when I have patients who come in and they say, you know, I've been on this medication for a long time and I'm just not sure if it's helpful, I have them stop it. Right. And so we figure out at that point if it's helpful and how it's helpful, because sometimes it, it really is not. One right. of the things about incontinence is it can be really hard to assess. Right. And so if I fix someone's incontinence and they are 90 percent better, that remaining 10 percent will make them crazy. Right. And it will become more bothersome because they're so close. And so, you know, that's where we really have to have patients do objective measures like um, bladder diaries, right? Especially for overactive bladder, where they're documenting 
how much better they are, right? So that you can say, look, you um, used to have 12 leaks a day. Now you have one leak a day. Um, you you are much better, even if you are not, you know, completely pleased with this result. So it, it really comes down to um, making patients do the homework so that you can objectively present that data. Great, that, thanks. that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, Dr. Boyles, thank you so much, not just for your presentation today, but for these fantastic resources um, to help empower us uh, in the care of our patients um, and for our patients. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. It was fun.